What's up guys, Mark back here with yet another review video and on today's show we're going to be taking a look at the Sony RX10 Mark III. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. The Sony RX10 Mark III is Sony's latest offering in its bridge camera lineup and dare I say, probably its best so far. The RX10 Mark III is a Cybershot camera, so technically this would be considered a consumer grade rig, but with cameras getting better and better in the right hands, there's honestly not much that you can't accomplish with this camera. First up, this camera is built around a 1 inch sensor as opposed to the APS-C size sensors that are found in the Sony a6000 and the a6300, which is roughly half the size. Conventional wisdom would tell you that this camera is going to do absolutely terrible in low light, but I found that it's honestly not too bad. And while they're not a completely perfect match, you can easily do a little bit of finagling depending on the type of lens and the focal range that you're using and get very similar results with both cameras. The 6400 ISO test was a little bit more of a disappointment on the RX10 Mark III, but overall I think that you're going to get a much better image than you would just a couple of years ago. Now the sensor may be small, but the form factor is not. For a bridge camera, this thing is pretty damn huge. It is considerably larger and heavier than you might be used to, especially if you're using some type of very small mirrorless camera. Uh, the RX10 Mark III weighs in at a hefty 2.41 pounds or 1,095 grams with a battery and a memory card installed, but the way I see it, you can carry around one camera with an extremely useful focal range for 2.5 pounds or you can carry a small dainty camera and a whole bag full of lenses. Compromises. And speaking of lenses, this thing is almost comical at max focal range. You almost have to ask yourself, how? How does it all fit in there? That's what she said. But with the larger form factor, you have lots of room to have more buttons, knobs, and wheels, which ultimately prevents you from always having to dig through a menu. A couple of the things that I really liked were the hold focus button and the focus mode selection switch. Just having those on the outside of the camera body was a total godsend. Not having to dig through a menu was just top notch with this. The RX10 Mark III offers a very nice 2.36 million dot OLED EVF and also comes equipped with a 3 inch 1.2 million dot tilt screen, both of which are very bright and very usable by today's standards. On the grip side of the camera, you're going to find the SD card slot, but I have just a tiny, tiny little gripe about this thing. It may sound a bit nitpicky, but I just wanted to go ahead and make you guys aware of it. First of all, I love that the card slot is not located in the battery compartment. Next, there is a strip of plastic just in front of the card slot that literally feels like an SD card. If you are not 100% sure, you might accidentally mistake this piece as an SD card already installed. Not to mention it also makes getting your card in and out of the camera a total hassle. While I'm sure it's not a complete and total deal breaker, I just wanted to make you guys aware that they still, Sony still cannot figure out exactly how to design a proper card slot. On top of the camera, we have a more DSLR style layout with plenty of knobs and buttons to make using the camera a lot more convenient than a compact mirrorless. Uh, that also includes the toggle switch to go from wide and tight. Uh, it's not as well polished as say like the power zoom of the 18 to 105, but it does the job fairly well. Next, I want to say that the hot shoe is totally solid when working with third party flashes. I tried three different brands and the RX10 Mark III worked perfectly with each and every one. So for you guys that are toning around some Young Nuo or Aperlite flashes, you are good to go. Next up, let's talk about the optics. With this particular camera, you get some Carl Zeiss Vario Sonar glass. You have an effective focal length of 24 millimeters all the way out to 600 millimeters. You have a maximum aperture of f 2.4, which makes it really good for low light situations. So overall, a really, really decent piece of glass. All right, let's start doing some video stuff. The zoom on this camera is just awesome. I am seriously impressed with this camera's zoom capabilities. That cell tower is a quarter of a mile away. With this lens, you get 25 times optical zoom, you get two extra with clear image zoom, and you get four times digital zoom. Now right here, I'm about to go into clear image zoom, and right here, I'm entering into the 
digital zoom. I mean, I can literally count the bolts on this cell phone tower. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. Honestly, uh, the tripod was not as stable or as heavy as it needed to be for that length of range, uh, but it did a really good job overall, in my opinion. If I'd had a heavier tripod, I think that this thing would have been just rock solid. But just being able to get in that close, I mean, you can literally take some shots of either wildlife or stuff that's extremely, extremely far away, stuff that you just don't want to interrupt, uh, intimate things that you just don't want uh, your subjects to uh, have any knowledge that you're videoing or photographing. This zoom is just ridiculous. I think that anyone that needs that extra range is going to find this unbelievable. And here's a quick shot that I took of the moon almost full, and this was using the digital zoom. I mean, I went all the way out to the max focal range, went past the clear image zoom, and went all the way to digital. And honestly, the picture is not horrible. I mean, I've seen a lot worse out of bridge cameras. Next, let's talk about close focusing. I honestly didn't know this, but this camera can focus at a minimum distance of just over an inch. So not only can you literally reach to the moon and back, but you can also take pictures of things that are extremely close to the lens. So there's no, you know, two or three foot minimum focus distance. So I took a picture of this pamphlet that was inside the box and it was perfectly in focus. So whether you need to go long or whether you need to go short, this camera's got you covered. Now in video mode, high ISO, these results were not even possible just a couple of years ago, especially with a one inch sensor. So this is at 6400 ISO. You can clearly see that there is a little bit of noise and grain uh, in the darker areas, which is to be expected, but it's not a completely unpleasing blocky digital grain. This is at 12,800 ISO, and yes, we are starting to get some of that sort of purpley digital artifacts in the darker areas, but even this, even this is still better than what I used to get on some of my high-end Nikon cameras just a couple of years ago. I am honestly quite impressed with how far sensor tech has come. Next up, let's talk about the bokeh on this particular camera, the RX10 Mark III being more of a quote-unquote consumer grade camera. I was just a little bit worried that maybe the bokeh wasn't going to be very nice, not very aesthetically pleasing to the eyeballs, uh, but I got to say, I'm pleasantly surprised. It honestly turned out really nice. Uh, the bokeh balls in general uh, have a really nice effect. They do have a little bit of onion skinning, um, but not nearly as bad as some of the other Sony lenses that I've seen in the past. Uh, we also have just a little bit of a halo effect on some of them. It doesn't happen to all of them, which is a little bit odd, uh, considering that most of these lenses these days are completely covered with the exact same anti-flaring kind of thing. But I think for the most part, you're going to have absolutely gorgeous results with this lens. Next up, this camera does in fact feature S-Log2. So for all you videographers and stuff out there, you are going to be able to get that extremely wide dynamic range with this camera. Uh, the ISO minimum level is gonna be 800 with this S-Log, so no S-Log3 where you can get down in ISO just a little bit, but this camera honestly handles low levels of ISO pretty phenomenally in my opinion. Even with a scene like this where you've got extremes in the dynamic range, you can still get the clouds in the sky without blowing those out, and you can also still retain detail in the shadows there in the trees uh, without much problem. S-Log2 on this camera actually works phenomenally well. There might be a little bit of a problem with high dynamic range shots where you might blow out a few of the highlights, especially in full sun without an ND filter because you're shooting at 800 ISO, but anyone experienced with uh, S-Log2 using it in video mode is going to know exactly how to compensate for those types of issues. So what about image quality? I know that most people are probably gonna be looking at this camera either for video or for just a good all around carry around camera. All these shots were taken straight out of the camera on auto mode. Um, the image quality is just phenomenal. I was honestly, seriously, very, very impressed. I mean, to have one camera with one lens with that level of focal range, I was able to get just about any shot that I was wanting to get. I could get very close, I could get far away, I could literally get all the detail I could possibly hope for. Very little uh, more, very little ghosting or artifacting. The colors were rich and vibrant. There was so much detail here. There was absolutely nothing that I was not liking about the image quality. There was so many things to love about 
the types of pictures that this thing can produce. The only thing that was a little bit concerning is the, the digital zoom, of course, is a little crappy. As you can see here in the photo, this was all the way out uh, to the max focal range, plus clear image zoom, plus the digital zoom, and you can see that it is getting very, very blocky and blotchy uh, in those darker areas. And considering this is kind of literally a point and shoot camera, the dynamic range, even in point and shoot mode and full auto mode, you're going to be able to retain lots and lots of detail. Uh, in the skies and the shadows, you're going to be able to keep a lot of detail that you probably wouldn't be able to keep uh, with your cell phone. So if you were thinking about buying this camera simply as your number one travel lens camera combo, this thing is amazing. As far as resolving power, and I realize that this is not a scientific test or anything, but it does resolve a lot of detail. Very, very fine, grainy, granular detail. You're going to be able to keep it all. Stuff that you would probably miss with your own two eyes. Uh, once you get them home, you're going to be able to see stuff that you never even noticed before. Overall, top-notch image quality in my personal opinion. So what about focusing manually with this camera? Honestly, I would advise against it. It's not very easy whatsoever. This is a focus by wire camera, so there's no actual mechanical mechanism that allows you to focus. So you're basically just kind of guessing unless you turn focus peaking on, which in my opinion is more of an advanced feature. So what about face tracking? Honestly, the A6300 does a phenomenal job. That thing hangs on like a pit bull. When it grabs a face, by God, it grabs a face. This one seems to struggle a little bit, not only acquiring a facial focus, but if you have a face moving in and out of the frame, it seems to sort of hunt around for the face, and then it tries to lock on, and even when it does, it takes a little while for it to finally grab a hold and then stick to it and then it doesn't even stick to it very well if your subject has sunglasses on you can just forget about it it just defaults to whatever's closest so ultimately what do i think about the sony rx10 mark iii after having this camera for uh, the last uh, few weeks i have really come to appreciate only having one lens. Uh, considering everything that this camera can do and considering the fact that uh, the stack sensor allows better low light performance and considering the fact that you have an extremely useful focal range, 24 all the way out to 600 millimeter, you tack all that on with the fact that not only can it do 4K video, uh, but it can also do 4K video with S-Log2. So for anyone that want to do both stills and video, this camera pretty much handles everything. If you're looking to not have to hassle with swapping lenses out, if this is going to be your first real uh, camera that can quite literally do just about anything that you would want it to do, then the $1,500 price tag is absolutely nothing. For $1,500, I think you're getting a lot of bang for your buck, and I seriously think that if you're looking for an all-in-one, if you're looking for a fantastic travel camera, if you're looking for a fantastic wildlife camera, uh, this is going to be an excellent, excellent choice. So there you guys have it. There you go. I hope you guys enjoyed this review video. And if you did, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. If you absolutely hated it, give it a big thumbs down. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed this kind of content. At any rate, guys, thanks again for stopping here at the Photo Video Show. I'm your host, Mark Puckett, and I will see you guys again on the next one. Peace.